my pleasure to be here. And again, thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm just going to jump into things since we're starting a few minutes late. I have a story that I'm going to share with you today uh, that focuses on one of the three areas of my research group, uh, focusing on the cardiometabolic benefits of green tea. I heard that this audience has heard of uh, NAFLD before, so um, I won't belabor the point. You all know that NAFLD is a progressive disorder starting with relatively benign steatosis and progresses in a subset of patients all the way to cirrhosis, fibrosis, and potentially liver failure and death. So clearly it's a problem. You know that the great majority of patients with NAFLD are obese and... Uh, Continue. Oh, okay. You're going to stand there the whole time? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know that NAFL is obesity related disease. We have no FDA approved treatments. And because of lack of pharmacological management for NAFL, there's been a tremendous emphasis on diet and lifestyle strategies to manage NAFL. We also know that weight loss can be effective. We also know as nutritionists that. When people lose weight, they do a terrible job of keeping it off. So clearly, while weight loss can have a benefit, we need to develop some alternative and complementary strategies so that uh, patients with NAFLD uh, could either reverse NAFLD or we can prevent NAFLD in the first place. My laboratory has kind of sat on the fence on both sides. Most of our studies have been on the prevention side in terms of our model systems, but we have also done some of our rodent studies in a therapeutic model, so intervening with green tea post NAFLD induction, and we see very similar results. We have focused on green tea based on epidemiological evidence from Japan, indicating that um, high consumption of green tea in a cohort of 40,000 Japanese adult, adults is inversely associated with CBD re related mortality. Roughly a third of, there's about a third lower risk of CBD death among high consumers of green tea. The benefits of green tea have been long attributed to its polyphenolic catechins, which are shown down here before. And what you can see down here is an HPLC profile of catechins across three different tea varieties, black, oolong, and green tea. If you're not aware, these three varieties of tea are all derived from the same tea plant. But differences in post-harvest processing result in unique phytochemical profiles, such that green tea has about four times as much catechins compared to black and oolong tea. And the principal catechin is this guy here, epigallocatechin gallate or EGCG, which accounts for roughly 50% of the total catechin content. I frame today's presentation in, in the context of CVD. But the reality is, and as you're all aware, is that NAFLD and CVD have very common etiological factors, insulin resistance, gut barrier dysfunction, obesity, dyslipidemia. When I started my faculty career many moons ago, when you go to PubMed, you type in CVD, you get 400,000 hits. Around the same time, NAFLD was a relatively unknown disorder, only about a couple thousand publications in the area. So I decided to carve out my own independent career by focusing on NAFLD relative to the training I got in redox biology at the Linus Pauling Institute. In this particular area, the goal of my lab is to identify the mechanisms by which green tea and or its polyphenolic catechins protect against cardiometabolic disorders, especially NAFLD. Early on in my lab, uh, we conducted rodent studies and 20 years ago, we didn't have a good model system for NAFLD. 20 years later, we still have criticisms on all the model systems for NAFLD. So we, we did our studies in two different model systems. One was genetically obese, OBOB mice, which many of you probably are aware are leptin deficient, don't truly recapitulate humans. We also use routinely high fat feeding as a model of diet induced obesity and NAFLD. Long story short, our early studies showed that regardless of leptin deficiency, Green tea was able to convert a liver that was incredibly steatotic into something that was mildly steatotic with some really remarkable anti-steatotic effects. We also observed that uh, green tea didn't have any dose-dependent or toxicological effects 
when green tea extract was fed in the basal diet at one to 2%, which corresponds to five to 10 cups of green tea, if you extrapolate that to human consumption patterns, which is also consistent with separate epidemiological studies suggesting improvements in cardiometabolic risk, as well as separate evidence suggesting that persons who consume high amounts of green tea have lower levels of liver um, injury biomarkers, alanine and aspartate aminotransferase. Regardless of model system, we also observed in association with less NAFLD that the mice had less hepatic oxidative injury measured by lipid peroxidation, downregulation of lipogenic genes, less insulin resistant based on calculated HOMA IR. And this led us to the hypothesis that green tea is protecting against NAPLD by downregulating NF kappa B mediated inflammation because many of these pathological features are driven by inflammation. So we targeted NF kappa B as the master transcription factor of inflammation. So we did the study where we measured NF kappa B binding activity in our high fat controls, as you would expect. NF kappa B binding activity was elevated, it was attenuated by green tea at one to 2%. Less binding activity occurred in association with less phosphorylation of IKB, which is the inhibitory protein for NF-kappa-B that prevents its translocation to the nucleus where it would induce pro-inflammatory responses. We corroborated these findings by measuring at the gene level and the protein level, two different NF-kappa-B dependent proteins and consistent with our NF-kappa-B data, these proteins and genes were also downregulated. So we felt pretty good about that. And we then sought out to figure out how the heck is green tea attenuating NF-kappa B? For those of you who are not familiar, NF-kappa B can be activated by a multitude of different pathways. Some involve receptor-mediated signaling through uh, TNF receptor as well as toll like receptor 4. The other pathway is upregulation of ROS can lead to the induction and phosphorylation of IKK, triggering NF kappa B translocation. Trained as a free radical biologist at the LPI, I hypothesized that it had to be a redox related mechanism. So we hypothesized that the antioxidant activities of green tea catechins would attenuate ROS accumulation to blunt NF kappa B activation. So around this time, I had a brilliant master student, Dana, showing up here on the right. Um, she'd be very disappointed in me if she was here because I reduced her master's thesis, which took her two years to one slide. <laughs> but that doesn't take away from the elegance and importance of her work. She, her master's project was to study how NAFLD affected endogenous antioxidant defenses, specifically copper zinc and manganese SOD as well as catalase as, and glutathione peroxidase. These defenses are critical for ROS detoxification. Dana showed that obese control animals had blunted enzymatic activities of each of these enzymes, and that supplementation of green tea normalized them back to the levels of lean controls. In association with those effects, she also showed that the degree of hepatic lipid peroxidation measured by HPLC, uh, this biomarker malondialdehyde, we're able to show that green tea could alleviate the severity of hepatic lipid oxidation. So, so far so good. We think it's a redox mechanism. Certainly suggests that. At around the same time, there's a lot of research going on with respect to the transcription factor, NRF2 which is a transcription factor that transcriptionally regulates many enzymatic antioxidant defenses. So these enzymes are under the transcriptional control of NERF2. So we hypothesize that green tea must be acting in a NERF2 dependent manner to alleviate redox distress and blunt anaphrapid activation. So I did the first and only cell culture study in my entire career. Actually, I didn't even do it. I had to farm it out to a friend in pharmacy who uh, had this cell line of uh, HCO4 cells. These are human hepatocytes that have low basal oxidative um, 
activation. And we treated the cells with physiological concentrations of EGCG for a couple hours, and then measured nuclear accumulation of NRF2. And as you can see from these Western blots that even at very low doses of EGCG, we had greater nuclear accumulation of NRF2. Like, yes, this is the answer. Green tea is having a redox dependent benefit. The same collaborator had a colony of NRF2 knockout mice. At the time these studies were done, these mice were not commercially available. So I was really excited to collaborate with them. And we did a feeding study, provided these NRF2 knockout mice high fat diets to induce NASH and plus or minus green tea supplementation. As we hypothesized, the NRF2 knockout mice had a high fat diet and no green tea, that a dramatic NASH phenotype, lots of hepatocellular ballooning, massive steatosis, incredible activation of NF kappa B, also increased lipid peroxidation compared to the wild type controls that had the same diet. The wild type mice that green tea had little to no pathology of NAFL. And here's where we started shaking our heads. The NERF2 knockout mice supplements of a green tea also had improved pathology. Clearly we were very wrong in our hypothesis because if green tea um, was acting in a NERF2 dependent manner, we would see no resolution of NASH. My PhD student at the time, Ava Slee, this was me and her arguing, you were wrong, no, I was wrong, you were wrong. So you're a terrible advisor. You steered me wrong for this 12-week study. I should also point out that these studies were conducted when I was transitioning from University of Connecticut to Ohio State University. The mice were shipped to me and I had to quarantine them for two months before I could even use them. So Mavis was even more angry at me for wasting so much time between quarantining and supplementation period. Long story short, NERF was not the answer. This is the first of a series of wrong hypotheses that I've had in my entire career. And I'm sure it won't be the last. So we went back to our pretty picture. Clearly, my training as a redox biologist was useless. And we had to start thinking about more complicated mechanisms involving extracellular receptors. In those NERF2 knockout studies, we salvaged the study by measuring, at least at the gene level, expression levels of colic receptor 4, TNF uh, receptor, message levels of TNF alpha, and circulating concentrations of LPS or endotoxin. And what we found was really remarkable is that green tea, regardless of NERF2 deficiency, attenuated the receptors as well as the ligands. Well, if you look at the picture, you can see that TNF alpha binds to a receptor, which leads to NF kappa B activation. Clearly, there needs to be some initiating event in order to induce TNF alpha in the first place. And of course, TNF alpha is NF kappa B dependent. So we hypothesized that green tea is probably acting initially to blunt endotoxin slash toll-like receptor four signaling to downregulate TNF. So we got our hands on some toll-like receptor four mutant mice. So these mice had dysfunctional signaling. They are protected from NAFLD. The model has some limitations, admittedly. The ideal model would be a toll four knock-in model that has heightened toll four activation. However, if you're not familiar, these mice die prematurely due to massive sepsis. So we had to do some reverse thinking with our experimental design. We fed wild type and toll four mutant mice, mice a high fat diet, plus or minus green tea supplementation. And consistent with our earlier studies, wild type mice fed green tea had resolved NASH. The mutant mice don't get NASH and provision of green tea has no additional benefit because there can't be. But what was really remarkable is that attenuation of nf kappa B activation in the wild-type mice fed green tea was knocked down to the same extent as the toll-4 mutant mice, suggesting, and I wave my hands very broadly and loosely, 
strong suggestive evidence that perhaps green tea is protecting against NF-kappa B activation in a TOL4 dependent man. We then wanted to understand how LPS was affected by TOL4 mutation. So we measured circulating endotoxin and we saw independent of genotype that green tea was able to lower circulating endotoxin concentrations. And at the level of the intestine, we measured the tight junction uh, protein, at least at the gene level, caught in one. And we observed in the upper and middle portions of the intestine, but not the lower intestine, that green tea, regardless of genotype, I guess I shouldn't call it uh, maintain, or excuse me, green tea, regardless of genotype, upregulated expression of clot in one. Suggesting that green tea perhaps is acting somewhat peripheral to the liver to limit LPS and its subsequent binding to hepatic pull 4 to signal in a type of the activation. So we were pretty excited with these studies up to this point. We felt that um, at the level of the liver, green tea wild type mice decreased NF kappa B and NASH to the extent attributed to the loss of toll like receptor 4 signaling in toll 4 mutant mice, suggesting a toll 4 dependent mechanism specifically at the liver. Conversely, green tea decreased metabolic endotoxemia and increased tight junction protein expression independent of toll-like receptor signaling. Taken together, we think that green tea is limiting nf kappa B activation at the liver in a toll 4 dependent manner at the liver, but in intestinal level benefits that limit gut-derived endotoxin translocation are independent of intact uh, toll 4 signaling. At this point, we were like really encouraged by our findings. My student Mavis and I started talking about the possibility that green tea is blocking endotoxin translocation. But the other possibility is you have to think of the other side of the equation. Perhaps green tea is enhancing endotoxin clearance via biliary reps. So Mavis, being a medical doctor from China, had incredible surgical skills. And she really wanted to understand the gut level benefits of green tea. And the way we did this was we wanted to take advantage of the fact that high fat feeding induces leaky gut. And the best way to assess endotoxin translocation would be to follow the plumbing. Mavis, being the brilliant surgeon that she is, was able to get a needle in the portal vein of a mouse Yes, it is very hard. She, I stood over Mavis's shoulder and I said, where's the portal vein? She goes, it's right there. I said, where? She goes, it's that thing that's about half the size of a piece of thread. In my old age, I couldn't even see it. She drew blood directly from the portal vein, gave us the opportunity to measure endotoxin directly from the portal vein. And what we observed was in the high fat controls, this is all wild type mice, in the high fat controls, greater levels of endotoxin in the portal circulation. Green tea in the high fat animals was able to attenuate portal concentrations of endotoxin, suggesting that green tea is blocking its translocation. In these uh, same mice, a couple of weeks prior to terminal surgery, we also did a functional test of gut permeability by gavaging the mice with a four or 50 dextrin. Gavage it, and then a couple hours later, you measure it in the circulation from a tail bleed. And we can see that 50 dextrin appearance in the serum was much higher in the high fat controls, suggesting quote unquote leaky gut. And green tea attenuated that response. And this occurred in association with decreased inflammation based on message levels of TNF alpha in the ilia, suggesting that there's some anti inflammatory mechanism that is attenuating leaky gut and endotoxin translocation. We were super jazzed by these studies because around the same time, a group from Europe, uh, Patrice, Patrice Connie and colleagues, published this seminal paper that um, had the title that was something like, uh, Metabolic Endotoxemia Initiates Obesity and Insulin Resistance. Did some really elegant studies demonstrating that high-fat animals 
for animals fed on high fat diet develop endotoxemia. If they were to put a osmotic pump in the mice fed a low fat diet, they can get endotoxin levels in circulation to the same extent as high fat feeding. However, in the absence of obesity, so just the LPS pump, they were able to induce subtle increases in hepatic triglyceride due to endotoxemia and also um, glucose intolerance and insulin resistance. So we were really jazzed where our studies were fitting into this broader literature suggesting that green tea uh, was having profound effects to improve metabolic phenotype of our mice that had NAPL. So like everybody else, based on our results that green tea is likely having some gut level benefit, we did our own series of 16S studies to study the microbiome. I am not a microbiome person, so Dr. Dillon, please don't crucify me because I'm not going to do this much justice. The statisticians tell me that these plots are really impressive, <laughs> where you get separation of your groups based on PCA analysis. It's our high fat controls separated nicely from low fat mice, regardless of green tea separation. And those high fat mice supplemented with green tea separated in a different direction. Apparently, this is really good. We had less diversity based on indices of Shannon index and Chow1. And for what it's worth, I know this is a bit outdated, but the Firmicutes to back bacteroidoides ratio, which is loosely described as a index of gut dysbiosis, was elevated in high fat controls and attenuated um, by green tea supplementation. We did our best to do a bunch of correlation analyses, and we saw that a whole bunch of bugs were correlated with a whole bunch of phenotype biomarkers. To be honest, we have not pursued this much further, uh, other than doing one other study where we saw virtually the complete opposite in the bug profile in a different cohort of mice that were raised identically. So what that means, I have no idea, and I leave that to Dr. Dillon to figure out. So, but one cool thing that we did uh, reveal in our studies, still at the level of the microbiome, we were able to do some predictive analysis on genomic functions that were differentially affected by high fat feeding and green tea supplementation. And the ones that stood out to me were genomic sequences related to butyrate metabolism and propionate metabolism. The high fat animals had lower genomic sequences for butyrate as well as propionate, and these were normalized by green tea supplementation. I know many of you are familiar with the importance of short chain fatty acids, but what you might not be aware of is that butyrate in particular helps to regulate the transcription factor HIF1-alpha, hypoxia-inducible factor 1-alpha. HIF1-alpha is super important for the transcriptional control of tight junction proteins. So what we observed was in our high fat controls that had less genomic sequences for butyrate, they also had less staining towards HIF1-alpha as well as less staining towards plotted one. And then with supplementation of green tea, it looked like immunohistochemical staining was restored for both the transcription factor and the tight junction protein at the level of the intestine. So we thought this was really exciting that green tea is having some gut level benefit, perhaps in a prebiotic manner to affect butyrate metabolism, to lead to the beneficial changes in HIF1 and downstream expression of body one and help protect against metabolic endotoxemia. Up until this point, my lab has been very food forward in its approaches. We've been studying green tea extract, which has the rich milieu of everything you find in the tea plant. I often got the question, what about caffeine? What about the fiber content? What about this? What about that? I said, enough. We're just gonna feed purified catechins, take the reductionist approach, and see to what extent do the catechins at their purified level account for the benefits of green tea extract. So we picked two catechins for these studies, EGCG, which is the principal catechin found in green tea. And we chose catechin, which is the simplest 
of all of them. You can see structurally, catechin is lacking a gallate group that EGCG has. And if the hydroxyl groups are important for RLS scavenging, catechin has less and therefore should be less redox active. So we took these very divergent amounts or divergent compounds, had a group of animals supplemented with green tea extract, a second group supplemented with EGCG at the equivalent dose found in green tea extract, and then a third group supplemented with catechin. But catechin exists in very trivial amounts in green tea extract, so we fed it actually at the equivalent level of EGCG so that we can make a pharmacological comparison between the two rather than studying its beneficial effect based on a 0.1% abundance in green tea. Here's what we saw, high fat controls, five to the seven time developed NASH. Green tea supplementation protects against that. EGCG protects against NASH to the same extent as intact green tea extract. Whereas catechin, does alleviate the pathology, but not quite to the extent of EGCG and glue had against an heart. So partial blunting, supporting the premise, a couple premises. One, EGCG is principally responsible for the anti-NASH effects. But two, that there's no additive benefit of caffeine based on our studies here. So this was really cool for us. And similar to this pattern of NASH activity scores, we saw similar trends for liver lipid peroxidation, serum ALT, endotoxin, uh, and then genes and proteins related to TOL4 and a path of these signal. We also saw at the level of the gut less protein for fecal palpitectin, which is a biomarker of neutrophil infiltration of the gut. So we were pretty jazzed about this. But given that we saw that catechin had some beneficial effect, clearly not to the same extent of EGCG, we were really curious to understand if it is the intact catechin having the beneficial effect or perhaps one of its microbial metabolites. And this is a really complicated question. I had to work with a, a colleague at OSU who's a metabolomics expert who was able to uh, do some fecal extraction, really poopy job, and measure the fecal metabolome from it. And what he found on my behalf was that in our three green tea related supplementation groups, whether it was intact green tea, purified EGCG or catechin, that this metabolite, 3, 4 dihydroxyphenyl gamma valerolactone, which sits downstream of all catechins, was increased in the poop samples of all the groups. And similarly, this metabolite, 3-hydroxyphenyl acetic acid, which is somewhere down here in this box, it didn't have room on the slide to show it, was also similarly elevated across the three groups, suggesting the possibility that perhaps the catechins themselves are having benefits or their benefits might be mediated by one of these microbial metabolites that is, um, well known in the literature to be well uh, absorbed, unlike the intact catechins, which have terrible bioavailability. So it's quite possible that at the level of the gut and at the liver, there might be two different things going on. And that's the hypothesis that I really wanna be testing moving forward, but we are trying to find a supplier for this metabolite. If there's any medicinal or synthetic chemists out there in China, 10 milligrams of this costs $2,000. So if you can make it cheaper here, I can then do the rodent study and see if this actually has a beneficial effect. So you heard in my introduction that I'm also a registered dietitian. Studies in mice are important to get mechanistic insight, but if I put my RD hat on, my goal in life is not to make healthy mice because healthy mice don't make healthy people. But there are any challenges for research translation, as many of you are well aware. Specific to this paradigm, we know that Americans don't wanna be sloshing around all day with five cups of green tea in their belly. We also know that Americans actually don't even like green tea. They prefer black tea. And black tea doesn't have much catechins compared to green tea. So to circumvent these challenges, 
started recognizing that Americans like snacking. In fact, we get about a quarter of our total calories from snacks on a daily basis. So the secondary way to circumvent this challenge is to collaborate with a food scientist. Dr. Votavos at OSU does amazing product development. She was able to develop a catechin-enriched confection, i.e. gummies, that are low calorie, 50 calories per day, and taste good, because most Americans don't like green tea because it's astringent. So she was able to make these gummies uh, such that we can deliver the equivalent of five cups of green tea in three equal doses with meals across the day. We also use a decaffeinated green tea for these uh, translational aspects because some people are caffeine sensitive. So our first adventure into this area was, are the catechins when part of a gelatinized confection, are they even bioavailable? We wanted to make sure that uh, they could be released at the gut. So we recruited some healthy persons as well as uh, persons who were obese. Their participants are up here, nothing really remarkable. The obese people have higher BMI and higher OMIR, but for the most part, all of their clinical chemistries were elevated, but within normal clinical limits. Patients came into our clinical center. They ingested these confections in the fasted state. We then did a pharmacokinetic study where we collected blood and urine for up to 24 hours. As your eyes are orienting here, you should see that the blue line is lower than the green line. The blue line is the obese patients. The green line is the healthy patients. Across the board, the obese persons had lower bioavailability of all catechins that were present in the infection. And it was roughly about 30% less area on the recurve across the board. We then measured those alar lactones. We were only able to measure two of them due to limitations in analytical standards that were commercially available. But we measured three, four alar lactone and three, four, five alar lactone, which are downstream of all the catechins. And what you can see is regardless of obesity status, the appearance of these volara lactones occurred equivalently between any of these persons. So on one hand, if the parental catechins are the beneficial entity, clearly the obese people need to ingest more if bioavailability is important for mediating the benefit. On the other hand, if it's the volara lactones, the obese people are probably getting just enough because their bioavailability of these volara lactones is equivalent. I don't know the answer to that. If somebody can tell me, that'd be wonderful. And that's why I really want to study these microbial metabolites. But what's really interesting with these PK studies is when we collect complete 24 hour urines and measure catechin excretion and valerolactone excretion, regardless of um, obesity status, urinary elimination of the two valerolactones that we're able to measure, and there are more, was double that of the total catechin that was excreted, indicating that the volar lactones are actually even more bioavailable than the parental catechin themselves. To me, that's just really remarkable that we have this maybe interdependence or symbiotic relationship with our gut to generate these metabolites that are even more bioavailable than the thing we're actually ingesting. And this also suggests the possibility of what is the right gut phenotype to promote the generation of these if they are functionally responsible for the benefits of green tea. Lots of open-ended questions there, lots of hand-waving on my part. But based on these PK studies, we wanted to take it the next step over in our research translational efforts. During the pandemic, like many of you, we were conducting randomized control trials. Those RCTs were shut down. Some of the patients completed the RCT pre-pandemic. We finally finished our RCT post-pandemic and we're still analyzing by a specimen, but I have some preliminary data to share with you that's not published. We conducted a very too complicated RCT. <laughs> uh, we recruited persons who had metabolic syndrome and age and gender matched healthy persons. They were fed the green tea enriched infections for a month, blood samples were collected at baseline, midpoint, and 28 days post-supplementation. 
crossover design with a one month washout and switching to the alternative treatment. In addition to collecting blood, at the end of the study, we collected stool samples so we can do 16S analysis. I don't have that data to share with you today. But we also um, performed a gut permeability test in the humans. And I'll share some cool stuff about that. And for this study, like our earlier PK study, they were fed the confection for delivery of green tea catechins at the equivalent of about five cups of tea. The other thing we did in this study was that we asked participants to follow a low polyphenol diet. Because as many of you are aware, um, everybody eats different diet. Polyphenols are found in fruits and veggies. We are terrible on the whole as Americans of eating fruits and veggies. Obese people are even worse than lean persons. So we wanted to try to level the playing field to some extent and standardize diets without being overly restrictive. So we asked the people with terrible American diets to consume a slightly more terrible American <laughs> diet by limiting their fruits and vegetables, but specifically polyphenol rich foods. Much to my surprise and delight, our participants actually followed instructions. Yay, participants. <laughs> um, on the left side is the dietary intake data for the healthy people. In both study phases, the healthy people reduced their polyphenol intakes, and they reduced their polyphenol intakes to be equally as bad as the MedS people. Yay, so far so good. We then evaluated the broader diet. I generally don't like to show tables full of numbers. On the whole, there were no truly remarkable changes in the diet. Calories stayed the same regardless of treatment arm, um, consistent with poor dietary record reporting by people. The healthy people consumed the equivalent a number of calories as the MedS people who were obese. And go figure. Carbohydrate didn't change. Protein changed a little bit by like 1% and went up in the in a time-dependent manner, but not in a treatment-dependent manner. That was unaffected. Alcohol actually went down by 1% in persons consuming green tea. So maybe green tea is good for curing alcoholism, I don't know. <laughs> the one that I highlight in, in red fiber, potentially important. We know Americans have terrible fiber intakes. We made them slightly worse, but nothing too remarkable. Went down from about 20 to about 18, so not a huge change. But much to my delight, there was no, there was only a time effect of fiber, meaning that regardless of treatment, fiber intakes decreased in both study arms in both cohorts. So no differences in fiber. Some of you may be aware of some of the bad press that green tea gets where certain persons exhibit um, acute hepatotoxicity. So we thought it was important to monitor safety in this study by measuring liver function tests, ALT and ASD. Our MEDS people had slightly higher levels of both ALT and ASD, but again, within normal clinical limits. There was no effect of green tea to alter ALT or ASD regardless of health status. So that was good news. When we look at fasting glucose, we saw consistent with our hypothesis that green or that green tea in the MEDS people attenuated fasting glucose to some extent, small but significant effect. Much to our surprise, we saw a significant effect in the healthy people who already had normal glycemia. This really surprised me, but certainly good news and suggests the possibility that green tea is important for glucose control. We still haven't run the insulin jet, so we don't know if we have a change in overall insulin resistance, but we certainly have a glucose benefit. At the level we go, which was our primary area of interest, from the fecal sample, we measured calprotectin as an index of neutrophil infiltration. We also measured mild peroxidase as an index of potential pro-inflammatory damage of the gut because mild peroxidase is well established to induce oxidative injury as part of the inflammatory response um, 
you know, where NPO is expressed in macrophages and neutrophils. So it's potentially a strong pro-inflammatory response. We saw that mild peroxidase, regardless of health status, we saw that green tea, regardless of health status, attenuated mild peroxidase. And that corresponded with a decrease in the health protection levels as well, suggesting that green tea is reducing oxidative injury at the gut by limiting neutrophil infiltration to the gut. Again, more hand waving because I was not actually in the gut to see what was going on, and I'm very happy about not being in the sewers. We then wanted to understand, given these anti-inflammatory effects, is there any beneficial effect on gut permeability? So we uh, used some literature uh, procedures to study region-specific gut permeability. On the last day of our intervention, we fed our participants a sugar probe solution that contained four different non-digestible carbohydrates, lactose, mannitol, sucralose and erythritol under the premise that lactulose is absorbed in the small intestine, it is not absorbed in the lower gut, whereas sucralose can be absorbed in the lower gut, but not in the upper gut also well. So we can get an index of region-specific permeability based on urinary elimination of these sugars. So fed the sugars, collected the urine for 24 hours, developed an LCM, LCMS method in my lab to measure these sugars. And then we actually did the experiment. <laughs> At the level of the lower gut, neither MEDS status nor green tea supplementation had any effect on sucralose excretion, suggesting no changes in gut permeability at the very lower or distal end of the gut. However, lactulose to mannitol was attenuated in both healthy and net ass persons, suggesting that green tea is helping to alleviate upper intestine permeability. This is really nice and corresponds nicely to some of the work we saw in our rodents where upper gut high junction proteins were improved by green tea, but not ileal high junction protein expression. So it's, it's pretty phenomenal that for once in my life, something that occurred in a mouse may be occurring in a human. And then our, our money was to measure circulating endotoxin we saw that consistent with improved gut permeability by green tea, circulating endotoxin was also <coughs> decreased in the healthy and meta person, suggesting that green tea is having some gut level benefit to block the translocation of endotoxin. Potentially, this is improving glucose homeostasis, and we have more work to do. Actually, we have to do a whole panel of pro-inflammatory genes from white blood cells that we have collected. I don't have those data today, but you can invite me in six months and we'll have the data. Um, but we wanted to understand now, what about short chain fatty acids? Our studies in rodents years ago relied on genomic sequences of short chain fatty acid metabolism. So, I had a brilliant postdoc who just left me last week, and I'm very angry at her because she's so awesome. I'm so mad she left, but I'm happy for her at the same time. She developed an LCMS assay so that we could quantify 10 short chain fatty acids from poop samples. And it included, I think, six straight chain short chain fatty acids and four branched short chain fatty acids. Going into this big spiel about chromatography and the elegance of her work, because that's all I can share with you today, because when we did the statistical analysis, there was absolutely no effect of green tea on the short chain fatty acids, which in a way is a good thing in terms of uh, narrowing our expectations of the mechanism, because now this suggests that the anti-inflammatory effects of green tea may be occurring, at least in humans, independent of some prebiotic effect that would affect the short chain fatty acids that are generated by the bugs. 
again, we were very angry. <laughs> so taking it all together, lots of food, food for final thought, at least for today. Like most nutrition related paradigms, observational or epidemiological studies have provided compelling reasons to consider health benefits of green tea polyphenols. Studies in rodents, including those from my lab and others, have provided good mechanistic insight that green tea catechins, independent of caffeine, provide anti-inflammatory activity along the gut liver axis to improve cardiometabolic health by limiting endotoxemia associated in rapid reactivation. Our short-term randomized control trial supports the premise that green tea catechins at least provided in a confection, improved glucose control in association with enhanced gut barrier function that likely limits endotoxemia. Missing links, but on the horizon, are understanding the microbial populations and or host microbiota metabolomic responses that may mediate the health benefits of green tea. And lastly, whether catechins themselves or the microbial metabolites of the catechins are responsible remains an open question, and I hope that we can resolve this question. I would love to do that study to figure this out. I wanted to do germ free study, germ free rodent studies to tease this question out. Some of you are probably aware that if you feed high fat diets to germ free rodents, they actually don't become obese. So that's a problem because you can't induce NAFL in those rodents. So I don't know how to address the question. If anybody has an idea, I'd love to hear your insight. And then last but not least, um, considerable thanks to my group past and present, who has contributed in so many different ways to the success of our preclinical and clinical studies. I have awesome collaborators at OSU, uh, Guy Brox, a biostatistician. Sissy is my postdoc who just left me. Uh, Julia is a former postdoc. Kronker, a former postdoc. Kalina, another former postdoc. Uh, Yael Vodovos, my food scientist. Zhang Tang Yu helps me with 16S analysis. Chris Zhu is my metabolomics expert, particularly untargeted metabolomics. And then in my former institute, I had lots of support, uh, including from Joan Smith, who was a veterinary pathologist who helped with the scoring of NAFL early in my career when I didn't even know how to do histology. So really thankful to her. And last but not least, the money people, in particular it's USDA, and I guess my claim to fame in science is I am really good, apparently, at convincing sponsors to give me money to test hypotheses that are not germane to their mission. If you're not aware, in the United States, all of our tea production, which is relatively little, is directed toward black tea manufacturing. Somehow, I was able to convince the U.S. Department of Agriculture to fund green tea studies. So I think that, to me, is my biggest delight in life. So thank you for all your tax dollars. <laughs> and with that, I will take any questions. Yeah. You mentioned that red has a connection to consume more tripress using the pharmacy language. The context of that question was a little bit tongue in cheek. I mean, literally, you'd have to drink like five or six of these a day. And exactly. Most Americans just don't drink that much fluid in general. Um, even when it comes to coffee, two or three cups a day for somebody at the higher end. That said, the NHANES data indicates that tea is the primary source of polyphenols or flavonoids in the diet. So, so I didn't really answer your question, but I gave you a different <laughs> answer. <laughs> I, I gave you the answer to the question I wanted you to ask. <laughs> yeah, definitely, like South Korea, they have a a lot more. What if there's any no study where they match ingestion of wheat there? I would say that water disease suggesting more there than here. Their dose, like enhance. Yeah. The, I'm pausing because I can't think of a study. And what gets really confusing about the epi studies is how do you define a cup of tea? Yeah. <laughs> um, so again, you know, epi studies are great for hypothesis testing. They're not causal in any regard. 
The other thing that I should note about the Asian culture that I, I came to learn when I visited uh, Korea and China to give similar talks is when they make tea, they start off with a pot of hot water, throw some leaves in, and they actually don't add more leaves throughout the day. They just keep adding more water. So the potency of the tea probably changes throughout the day, which makes the epi study even harder to rely on <laughs> because while you might be able to measure by ounces what a cup is, there's no standardization of what's in that cup. So I'll answer the second part first. The claim about the leaky gut in humans and its location is based on our sugar probes. The lactulose gamanitol reflects upper gut permeability. In our mice, the immunohistochemistry studies that I showed, I think were from the jejuna or the ileum, but not the uh, cecum. Um, so mid gut, perhaps, the mouse. Does that answer your question? Okay. Okay. <laughs> you stumped me. We did those studies so long ago, and you can see the histology wasn't particularly pretty because we didn't know what we were doing at the time and how to handle the tissue properly for. I have, a, I have a question about uh, reproducibility that I think if you haven't already published it, you should publish it. Um, is the person, when you looked at the microbiome mm -hmm. and the change, is the person with the highest level of something in your control study the same as the person as the high, with the highest level in your treatments? You've got repeated measures on microbiome, and I'm wondering about differences within, within groups of people. Yeah, so... We haven't finished the 16S analysis in our humans, but what we hope to find is a lot of inter-individual variability as you probably will with yeah. human microbiota. Yeah. And what I'm hoping to find is, are there certain persons who are high producers of valerolactones that have high populations of certain bacteria? And look at it from a precision nutrition approach. Yeah. So few microbiome studies have done controlled crossover. Yeah. So please, well, mind I, that. Because I, I was talking to Dr. Dillon about this uh, earlier today. Even though the microbiota can shift in response to diet fairly quickly, I don't know if we still have a clear answer of what is an appropriate washout yeah. period <laughs> to really know. Right. Uh, so, yeah, we have a lot of data mining to do. I think we have another question back there. Um, what are risks of the eventual? Germ free, you don't know what cause the liver. Yeah. You label the three things, right? And you see the structure of the sufficient from the liver. You have a direct monitor. I'm not sure I understand the question. So the germ-free mice, if you feed them a high-fat diet, they won't get obese. No, I agree with that. Okay. Um, they can be green tea, they can be green tea, right? Mm -hmm. You're going to secrete the uh, marker of this is a marker of this fat, right? Like a fat. Mm -hmm. That was where I was going. It sounds like you're looking to collaborate with me on something you're working on here with your patients and the 300 people. <laughs> no, no, no. I like your thinking. I'm, I'm trying to think through the experimental design in my head as you describe it. And I'm not sure. We should probably talk a little further and figure it out because we can. I was sharing with Dr. Park earlier, we're actually growing uh, deuterium labeled spinach. So we theoretically could grow deuterium labeled tea leaves and do something similar to what you're describing. An expensive salad. That's right. <laughs> Isn't that fantastic? Yeah. Yeah, wow. Any other questions? <laughs>
Well, thank you all for being here. It was a pleasure. I hope I get a few fans. People online. So. Yeah, I'm glad you worked out.